Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for being here. Um, the uh, topic of supercontinent cycles in eastern North America um, can be focused in this way. Uh, nearly 50 years ago, Tuzo Wilson, who's a famous uh, Canadian geologist, asked the question, did the Atlantic Ocean close and then reopen? The answer to that clearly is yes, and I think it's not only yes, but yes at least twice, and perhaps earlier than that. But tonight I want to focus on the last two of those supercontinent cycles. A supercontinent cycle involves the assembly of all of the continental crust, or nearly all of the continental crust on Earth, into a single large continent. Uh, the earliest of these that we're going to talk about is Rodinia. Then Rodinia broke apart, and an ocean opened, the Iapetus Ocean, roughly in the position of the present Atlantic relative to the other continents. But Iapetus closed. The continents all came together to form a second supercontinent, Pangaea. And then Pangaea has broken apart, and the Atlantic Ocean is still opening. And that's the cycle we're looking at. So tonight I want to focus on these two supercontinent cycles. Uh, one thing I should say sort of uh, as, as a general concept here is that the effect of each of these later processes has done some damage to the geologic record of the previous processes. There's kind of an overprinting of deformation as well as a, a deposition of sedimentary cover. So in order to look at the geologic record of the older phases, we have to effectively restore what was done during those later stages. And so what I'm going to be showing you are those kinds of restorations. But it's important to recognize that we're not necessarily looking at things where they are now, but where they were before they were later deformed. So to begin our story with Rodinia, this is uh, a reconstruction of Rodinia. The continent of North America is here. But uh, what I want to emphasize here is that the uh, orangish color uh, here represents the rocks that show indications of deformation, of being squeezed together, or of being uh, raised to elevated temperatures so that uh, there was some melting producing magmas and crystallizing as igneous rocks. And you can see those are distributed around where the various pieces of Rodinia bumped together. But I want to turn now to look specifically at the eastern part of North America. So this is the Grenville origin. Origin means mountain belt. So these are the uh, Grenville age mountain belts. They range in age from uh, 1350 or so down to a thousand million years, and throughout I'll be using the designation MA as million years. Uh, also, I'm going to be using this map um, for a lot of my illustrations, and so just to uh, get you geographically plugged in, this is Florida. Uh, the Big Bend in Texas is over here, uh, Newfoundland, and uh, of course Knoxville. Okay, so now you know your way around the map. So what I've outlined here shows the area where rocks with the Grenville ages of deformation and melting uh, can be found. The western boundary of that is called the Grenville Front. One way of looking at this is this is the edge of all of this stuff that was being pressed up against the even older continent uh, that is in the areas shown here by various different colors. Now to look at a couple of specifics relative to um, the uh, Grenville origin. This is a seismic reflection profile across the Grenville front in Lake Huron. Uh, this is done by uh, sending sound waves down into the earth recording the travel times. So the way to think about this is this represents the surface and this is a cut down into the earth. And I want to call your attention 
to these layered reflectors indicating a layered fabric in the rocks. And that extends all the way down to a depth that corresponds to the base of the crust. So this shows that the Grenville boundary here, where these rocks were being pushed up against the pre-Grenville part of what is now North America, uh, it was a process that extended all the way down to the base of the crust. Uh, another point is that uh, looking at the ages of accretion events, this is these compressional effects as well as heating and melting, uh, can recognize that the Grenville origin doesn't represent a single event, but that there is a succession of events uh, with a variety of ages, primarily between 1,250 and 1,000 million years. Uh, some detailed work here in the Llano region of Texas uh, shows uh, the collision of various terrains at a succession of times, uh, ultimately to build the entire edifice that we would call the Grenville origin. But I wanted to emphasize from this that this is not one event, it's a succession of activity spread through about 250 million years, and the net result is the Grenville origin. A couple of other uh, specifics that I want to look at here. Um, if we take the best information that we have for the Grenville front, it has a rather sharp bend in this area. And the location of that bend corresponds to um, an alignment of dikes. These are igneous rocks that have been emplaced along fractures that trend northwesterly. And I've suggested that these dikes represent a fracture system that was cutting across here and that perhaps produced an offset in the shape of the continent that preceded the arrival of the Grenville rocks, and when Grenville was pressed up against that, it bent around uh, that outline. Uh, and the age on these dikes is 1.4 billion years, so this is sort of possibly a, a little bit of a hint at what was the event prior to the assembly of Rodinia. Uh, I want to point out a couple of other things. This is the restored location of the Blue Ridge. We've moved it back quite a bit here to move it back where it was before it got smashed up against uh, North America later on. And uh, it's been recognized that the uh, Grenville Age rocks in the Blue Ridge have some geochemical differences from some of the other rocks, particularly up into Canada and the Adirondacks, uh, suggesting that these rocks may have originally been uh, completely separate from those and that they were brought together during the Grenville reconstruction. There's a magnetic anomaly here called the uh, New York Alabama lineament, which is a long linear boundary in the magnetic field, uh, and it's been suggested that perhaps that represents the boundary between these Grenville rocks and these Grenville rocks. But this is all absorbed into overall what we would call the Grenville origin. Now, further south, the uh, Llano Uplift of Texas that we talked about a little bit before, when compared to the Grenville Age rocks in the pre Cordillera of Argentina, uh, shows the same general ge ge geochemical characteristics, uh, suggesting that these were originally uh, close together. I've outlined here in white uh, the shape that we attribute to the Argentine pre Cordillera. Let me explain that the pre Cordillera of Argentina is, as you might guess, in Argentina now. But uh, we interpret it to be a fragment of continental crust that originated here. So let me turn now to the next phase. This is the breakup of Rodinia and the opening of the Apatis. And again, it's a succession of events spanning a time from about 750 to 530 million years. Uh, the green lines here, and I've color-coded all of the Eapatan rifting events in green, uh, shows a zigzag outline of the continental crust. And uh, to distinguish this from modern North America, this piece of continental crust that forms the continent 
that was isolated by this process of the breakup of Rodinia, uh, we'll call Laurentia. Okay, one way of looking at this is this is the uh, uh, predecessor to present North America, but one cycle earlier. Now I want to focus in on this part of the diagram for a minute. Uh, this is a block diagram to illustrate my interpretation of the uh, nature of the rift. And if you're looking along this part here, I would suggest that the cross section shows the rift pulls apart a series of broken blocks, but there is a larger scale detachment that is inclined down underneath this part of the continent. So what I've labeled here is the Texas Promontory, which is part of Laurentia and now part of North America, was the upper plate riding above that inclined detachment. The lower plate is characterized by these broken up blocks along um, a succession of uh, fractures of that same geometry. We recognize these differences because the overall history is that the upper plates along these broken margins tended to stand relatively high, not receive very thick sediments, and in fact undergo erosion uh, for later times, uh, whereas the uh, inclined blocks of the lower plate uh, accumulate great thicknesses of sediment accumulations right along the rifted margin. Uh, and we see this, uh, incidentally, in the Blue Ridge here, just east of uh, Knoxville. Now, where the um, boundaries between opposite directions of inclination of the detachment, uh, those boundaries form nearly vertical fractures called transform faults. And so we're looking here at a section of the rift offset by a transform fault, another section of rift, a transform boundary, and so on. So we really have three kinds of boundaries here, and we sort these out on the basis of the distribution of sediment that covers them. While we're out at this, I'll put in an absolutely shameless plug for my presentation in the department tomorrow afternoon. Uh, the entire topic will be looking at the Argentine Precordillera and uh, tracking uh, its story from where it originated uh, here in southern Laurentia to its present location in the uh, eastern Andes in Argentina. To look at the distribution of uh, rocks that record the nature of the rift, uh, this bluish color I've used to show places where relatively thick sediment has accumulated. Uh, as along the Blue Ridge here, there are several other spots uh, variously along the margin. There's also a set of fracture systems into the continent, not part of the breakup of the continent, but fractures showing extension within continental crust, uh, such as these uh, structures here, and they're also filled with uh, sediment. In addition, there are igneous rocks, rocks that crystallized from melts, uh, that included uh, lava flows, uh, volcanoes, and so on. And in red, I've shown the uh, radiometric ages of those uh, rift igneous rocks. And I want to call your attention to the total age range here from about 765 uh, to around 530 million years. But if you look at the spread of ages, 700 here, 765, 614, a lot in here around 560. There is not a systematic distribution indicating that this was a rather messy process of breaking up the continent of Rodinia. You can almost hear the cracking going on as it's breaking apart. Now, we've talked about the structure of the Grenville rocks, and particularly the Grenville front, but I think it's important to recognize that the Appleton Rift did not particularly follow that old suture where the Grenville rocks were pressed up against the pre-existing continent, uh, but rather it cuts across in some places, as it does here. And I want to show you just one bit of evidence for uh, why we interpret the Grenville front to have been broken uh, by the continental margin there. Uh, this is uh, 
an outcrop in Argentina in the eastern Andes. Uh, it's a uh, conglomerate, but it has some clasps in it that are uh, granodiorites to granites, and they have age dates of 1,370 to 1,367 million years. Okay? So uh, you're going to have to memorize that number because we need to look at it in, uh, in another context here. On this map, I've put the Argentine Precordillera back in place and point out that the ages of the Grenville rocks, including the Llano part of Texas, range from about 1,000 to around 1,250 million years. The granite rhyolite uh, rocks of pre-Grenville North America, shown here in yellow, have ages about 1480 to 1320. Now, in the Precordillera, most of the rocks do have ages around 1,200. So they're part of the Grenville. But we have that one sample that I just showed you that's 1370. It's older than Grenville. And so we suggest that the Grenville front originally crossed along something like this, and when the Precordillera broke away, it took this little piece of the Granite Rhyolite province with it, and I just showed you a little sample of that. Now, at the end of the rifting process, a passive margin develops. This is a margin that's no longer structurally active. The faults are not moving. And um, the deposition of continental shelf sediment begins. This is characterized by uh, carbonate rocks, limestones like the present Bahamas Banks or uh, South Florida. And we find carbonate rocks lying on the old Eapitan rift rocks from Newfoundland all the way south to Texas. There's some differences in ages here in terms of when these rocks began to be deposited because the passive margin evolved the same way the rift did, some place in one, sometime in one place, sometimes in another. And there's also a carbonate cover on the Precordillera of the same age and, and general makeup as these over here. So this is um, the characteristic evolution of a passive margin after the rift event has been completed. So now we'll turn to the next step in the supercontinent cycle, the assembly of Pangaea. And this is the set of processes that produced what we call the Appalachian Washita origin, the mountain belt. Uh, in present North America, we can trace that from Newfoundland uh, down as far as uh, central Alabama, where it goes under the Gulf Coastal Plain. But using drill data and seismic uh, reflection recordings, we can trace it in the subsurface under the coastal plain to the outcrops in the Ouachita's, then back under the coastal plain to the outcrops in the Marathon region of West Texas, and down into Mexico. So we add uh, another quite lengthy piece to the Appalachian mountain system. Uh, one point I would make here is that in a very pale green now underneath the cover and the distortion that we've introduced with the Appalachian system, uh, you can see the old Eapitan rift margin, uh, and you can see the curves shown by this blue line in uh, the Appalachian Washita Orogenic Belt. And those curves correspond to the offsets in the Eapitan margin, indicating that when these rocks were being pushed up against Laurentia. The rocks of the uh, compressed Appalachians and Washita's adapted to the shape of that continental margin that already existed. So we've just added on to that shape. Now, I should point out, too, that we're looking at something that in includes, again, a succession of events uh, that span about 200 million years. And I want to show you um, a little bit of the timing of the earliest of those events. It's called the Taconic. Uh, this would be in the 400 plus million year range. The blue lines here show the progress of collisions of other continent, continental pieces or island arcs with the Laurentian margin. The green line shows the rifted outline 
of the Appleton Rift. And the way to think about this map is look at this line. That represents a point in time. Then as the system moved forward, it moves from here over to there and to there and so on. It's like waves approaching a shoreline. And what I wanted to call your attention to is if you look at these in terms of time, uh, what we can record in the ages of the rocks that indicate the initial collisions is that they occurred first in Newfoundland, uh, a little later uh, in Alabama, and the collision in Alabama migrated northeastward into Tennessee. A little bit later, there's a collision in Pennsylvania, and then the very latest is a collision in southern Quebec. My point of this is that there is a great variation in detail in terms of the ages at which these collisions occurred, uh, but we can equate those to the pre-existing shape of the margin of the continent. As, remember now, this is taking on the shape of that rifted margin as these rocks are advancing up against it and sort of wrapping around uh, the uh, promontories. Uh, let me also be sure to uh, point out that this is not intended to show a single continent or a piece of a continent coming in to Laurentia. This is the front of a cluster of various fragments, con pieces of continents, island arcs, and so on. So this is just an average front for all of that activity. Now, there are several recognizable events here, but I'll just skip on to the last one and um, point out the collisions that occurred along uh, the Appalachian side. But there's a particularly instructive look here in the Washita and Marathon region where the collision first occurred here uh, in uh, Mississippi in the subsurface and then migrated into uh, the center of the um, embayment in the continental margin and finally reaching into this embayment. So again, we're seeing that same progression as these events sort of wrap around the shape of the margin. The very latest event over here uh, is the accretion of what is called the Sewanee terrain. Uh, the blue lines again show it migrating into place, and I want to look at that in a little more detail uh, in just a minute. But before we do that, uh, I want to show you this kind of um, schematic interpretation of the makeup of uh, a typical orogenic belt, such as the Appalachian uh, Washita one. On uh, the most outer side, farthest away from the uh, Laurentian continent, are accreted terrains. These are the blocks that were coming in uh, in those waves that I just described for you. It'd be things like the Suwannee terrain that I pointed out is down here. But mixed in with the accreted terrains are some fragments of the basement rocks or continental crust of Laurentia in internal basement massifs. And then farther west are some external basement massifs. The Blue Ridge in Virginia is an example of one of these. And then Driven, driven in front of that is a uh, set of thrust faults where the sedimentary rocks from here are pushed up toward the west, crowded together. The, the net result is to take a distance that was originally something like this and push it up into a much smaller space. So we're, we're in effect seeing shortening of the rocks here. Uh, a couple of things I want to add here is that uh, the external basement massifs like this illustrate a, a point relative to how we can restore uh, the structure of the uh, originally Appleton margin. The little bright green line that I put in there and here, if we push this back to where it came from, this piece would come back to here. And this piece would come back to here, sort of smoothing out the top of that rock and showing us the location of the rift. And that was the kind of technique that we used to draw this map with the green lines on it. Now, another thing I want to point out here is that the um, pushing of these rocks up onto the continental crust 
makes a gravitational load that causes the crust to sink. That pushes it down, making a basin out in the foreland or out in front of the thrust belt, and those basins fill up with sediment that is eroded from the mountain belt. So if we look at the sedimentary accumulations in these foreland basins, they tell us about the evolution of the mountain belt. When, when was the mountain belt forming? How much of it had formed? How deeply was it depressing uh, the crust? Because we can determine that from the thickness of the sediment that is accumulated. So this is an analysis of those accumulations of sediment. We call them plastic wedges. These are um, accumulations of sediment uh, that are plastic particles that is broken up down to sand grain size or pebbles or even mud. And um, I've sorted out three different ages here, the oldest ones, the sort of intermediate ages, and then the latest ones. And I think you can see here that the older ones are uh, centered here in Tennessee, uh, there's some in Pennsylvania, in Quebec, and in Newfoundland. And these are the ones that I pointed out earlier are different ages because as we trace those dashed blue lines into the continent. Uh, the intermediate one is centered primarily here in Pennsylvania, and then the later one, the Alleghenian, uh, we can trace from Pennsylvania and Tennessee, but it's particularly important around the Ouachita and Marathon regions. Now that gets us back to um, the Sewanee terrain, and I want to uh, look more specifically at it at this point. The Sewanee terrain is known from deep wells that have been drilled in uh, North Florida, uh, South Georgia, and southeastern Alabama. The wells have drilled into uh, basement rocks, that is rocks of, of continental crust that are in terms of the geochemistry and in terms of the age of those rocks, um, part of Africa. There's also a sedimentary cover here that is not the carbonate rocks that we talked about as being part of a carbonate shelf around uh, Laurentia, but rather these are uh, sandstone and mudstone uh, like the equivalent rocks in Africa, and there is an assemblage of fossils in these rocks that are African. Um, finding African rocks here, or African fossils here in North America, and comparing these or contrasting these with the same fossils of the same ages that we see over here, uh, one of my paleontologist friends uh, once said, this, this is the equivalent of finding a native kangaroo in Kansas. So uh, you conclude from that that uh, these must have come from somewhere else. Now, the boundary between these rocks and the rest of Laurentia is a band that I've drawn here with two dashed lines. And we know from um, some small exposures here, from uh, drill holes, and from seismic uh, reflections like those I showed you for the Great Lakes, for uh, the Grenville, uh, that this is a, a zone of compressed rocks that represents the boundary between uh, some African crust here and uh, Laurentian crust over there. If we uh, expand that view a little bit, uh, Sewanee is not alone. Uh, there's another terrain here, the Sabine terrain uh, in uh, Louisiana and East Texas. Uh, we don't know as much about it as we do about Sewanee because there are no wells that have actually drilled into the basement rocks of Sewanee, but we do have geophysical representation of, of Sabine uh, and also of sediment that is washed off of it that we can analyze and also some volcanic ash beds. Uh, piecing that information together, uh, Sabine is also either African or South American and not Laurentian. And then there's another piece over here, Coela. Uh, which has generally the same characteristics as Sabine. So what we're looking at here is an indication that these accreted terrains, fragments of continental crust, have collided with the Laurentian continent to, in effect, add on to the continental crust that was already here at the Yapitan rifted margin. 
Uh, we also can see that if in the re reconstruction of the Appleton margin here that the Sewanee deformation affected a significant part of that old continental margin and destroyed it to the point where we can't recognize it geophysically at this point. So in summary uh, of Pangaea, the assembly represents several different events, uh, collisions at different times with various uh, fragments of continental crust, volcanic arcs, um, uh, along the entire margin. The leading edge, that is the sedimentary rocks that were being pushed out onto Laurentia, accommodated to the pre-existing shape of the rifted margin. and then these accreted continental terrains added on to continental crust and modified the shape of the margin of Laurentian crust. And so if we look at where this fits into the assembly of Pangaea, uh, North America is here. That little funny looking thing is Florida. Um, the margin that we've been talking about that is the Appalachians and the Ouachita's extends down along here. Uh, South America and Africa are placed with respect to it and you'll notice there's kind of a little extra room in here where the Gulf of Mexico is going to be and so on. This is the space that was filled in by those accreted continental fragments such as Sabine and Sewanee. And so that's why we're getting a little, little space in here. Those are the blocks that have been uh, in effect crunched up between the continents. So having uh, assembled Pangaea, uh, we'll now look at the breakup, the opening of the Atlantic, which began about 230 million years ago and is continuing to the present because the Atlantic is continuing to open. Um, for the Iapetan margin, I pointed out that we have to restore it to remove the effects of uh, later deformation. Uh, the Atlantic margin obviously is still there. It's being covered by sediment of the present passive margins, but the transform faults, the offsets uh, that we can recognize, are actually known from the distribution of transform offsets of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a ridge formed by the spreading of seafloor in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in terms of this map, it would be way on out here uh, to the right. Uh, but we can trace those transforms using uh, magnetic maps all the way into the point where they intersect the continental margins. So we have a somewhat different approach to the um, uh, Atlantic margin, uh, and particularly in terms of the transform offsets than uh, we did for Iapetus. Now I want to look at a couple of uh, specific points down in this area. First of all, the Bahamas Fracture Zone, uh, which is a transform fault from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge through the Bahamas, uh, can be traced across South Florida. It's the boundary between the African rocks and uh, the younger igneous rocks uh, that are associated with the Bahamas Fracture Zone. And we can project it into uh, the area just north of the Mississippi Delta. Now, it is located in a position so that it produces the offset from the Atlantic margin over to what we might call the Gulf margin, a big transform offset of the rifted margin. But that Bahamas transform offset is almost perfectly coincident with where we have mapped the Alabama-Oklahoma transform offset of the Appleton margin. It's a suggestion that transform faults may find old weaknesses associated with older transform faults and then reoccupy that position. Now, having said that, if we look at the relationship between the rifts and the transforms and the old sutures, the textures that are produced during these collisional events, the Sewanee terrain is here. Uh, the dark blue line here is kind of an average location for that wide boundary at the north edge of the Sewanee terrain. But you'll notice that that compressional 
suture is cut across by the transform fault here and it's cut across by the rifts going up this way. So the rift and transform margin here did not reactivate this older extensional or, or older compressional margin. Now I mentioned in talking about the Iapetan margin that there's some, in, uh, some fracture systems inside the continent. You can see one here drawn in in the green lines. It's parallel with the rift, again following the green lines here. But it is not a boundary that extended the continental crust so much that the continent broke apart. It just stretched it some, it broke a little bit, and uh, sediment filled uh, a, uh, down, uh, a downwardly displaced block in that fracture system. There are similar faults associated with the opening of the Atlantic. I've shown them here in the orange lines. Uh, there's a rather large one here. It's in the subsurface, but we know this from drill data. Uh, it's called the South Georgia Basin. It's a uh, rather deep downdrop block filled in with sediment. Now, it does more or less follow the um, Sewanee suture. So there's a question here. Maybe some of the structures of the rift and pull apart are reusing some of the old compressional structures. Maybe others are not. So as we're in the process of opening of the Atlantic, the active fractures uh, that produce this margin uh, have uh, long since ceased. The activity is now out at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And a passive margin has evolved uh, along all of this. It's being filled in by sediments such as the Mississippi Delta or the carbonate sediments of South Florida or uh, the Bahamas. Uh, a little earlier, there's carbonate deposition along the Grand Banks and so on. So uh, I'd also point out there's another example, I think, of a inheritance of the location of a transform fault. There's a big offset here, uh, the Satil transform uh, from uh, Quebec to Newfoundland. And in almost the same location, but aligned with it, is the Grand Branks transform of the uh, present Atlantic margin. So what I've tried to do uh, tonight is take you through uh, a look at a succession of two supercontinent cycles. I think we have an extraordinary record of two supercontinent cycles in eastern North America. Uh, we began with the assembly of Rodinia, the uh, Grenville event of compression, followed by breakup and stretching of the continental crust and breaking up of the crust, uh, opening of the Apatus Ocean, uh, then the closing of the apatus, the compression of uh, various fragments onto Laurentia uh, to produce the Appalachian uh, Washita mountain system in the center of supercontinent Pangaea, and then finally the breakup of Pangaea and the opening of the Atlantic. Now to look at some of the details of interrelationships between these, I've lifted off the color here uh, so you can see through. and. Um, the point I made earlier was we recognize these older uh, dikes and fracture systems that suggest possibly before the assembly of Rodinia there was a bend in the continental margin here and that the Grenville system wrapped around that bend, aligned uh, with where the bend is aligned with this 1.4 billion year old system of dikes. Then uh, there's the breakup of Rodinia and an indication that the big transform offset here, uh, the transform along which the Argentine Precordera de departed, was aligned with that same bend in the Grenville front. So there's an indication here of inheritance of the location of a transform fault. Then the Appalachian Washita system wraps around all of the offsets of the Appleton margin, suggesting again that what was being compressed against Laurentia was accommodating to the shape of the pre-existing continental margin. And during that process, also there was the addition of some continental crust, such as the Sewanee terrain along this boundary here. And then, uh, following the assembly of Pangaea, it broke up and 
uh, process was the opening of the Atlantic. And uh, I pointed out uh, the uh, coincidence of location and the possibility of tectonic inheritance of the location of the Bahamas transform with respect to the Appleton, uh, Alabama, Oklahoma transform. And also pointed out that this transform fault and this rift do cut right across the Sewanee suture saying that it's not reactivating the old compressional structures, but the South Georgia Basin follows right along that, suggesting that maybe some extension did operate along the old compressional structures. So um, that is the story, two supercontinent cycles, an indication that there is a, a tectonic inheritance effect from one supercontinent cycle to the next, uh, but uh, in total, su suggesting that what we can see here in eastern North America is a record over the past 1.2 billion years or so of the assembly and breakup of a succession of two supercontinents. So, thank you. Uh, probably the um, most obvious place would be um, a publication in GSA Today. It was in 2006, and I'm sorry that's as close as I can come to a reference right now. But uh, it is available through the Geological Society of America. I probably should have pointed out that this uh, presentation was uh, uh, sort of a derivative of my uh, presidential address for the Geological Society in 2005, and then that address was published. And it has in it uh, four of these maps. GSA Today, 2006? Yes. Uh, and then a geological question. Can you tell us something about what is known or speculated about the pre Rodinian Um, at the level of detail that I've tried to talk about here, I don't think we can do very much other than suggest things like I did with perhaps the age of this dike. Uh, there have been several uh, earlier supercontinents recognized by piecing together geochemical similarities between various blocks and so on. In fact, there's been sort of a, a cyclicity of supercontinents at about the same time frame uh, that we'd be looking at here, uh, roughly one billion years, uh, roughly uh, 300 million years, something like that. So every 400 to 700 million years, um, there's an, another supercontinent cycle. Is there a name associated with that earlier? Uh, yes, and I don't remember it. <laughs> one, one is called Columbia, Columbia, uh, there's another one called Ur, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that's about as far as I can go. <laughs> uh, you showed the map with all these uh, continental plays of Ur. <laughs> uh, has ever uh, a similar thing like a recent cycle which you covered in any other uh, opening and closing of oceans? Because I have a hard time to believe in the recent cycle because there were only Oops, I didn't. I was going to try to find a map. The um, assembly of a supercontinent, uh, and we could do this with the Rodinia map, but Pangaea shows it as well. Um, the Atlantic Ocean, of course, is a 
an ocean basin uh, in this position and also down through this position. At the time Pangaea was assembled, all of the rest of the world was a large ocean. So this ocean shrank in size, if you want to think about it that way, as North America, Africa, and South America moved apart, opening up part of an, o an ocean in here and decreasing the size of the ocean that's out in, in both sides. And we can make the same case for uh, Rodinia, that when the continents were all together in one supercontinent, all of the rest of the world was a single large ocean basin. And it goes out and it comes back. Uh, no, a mushwad is a smaller scale. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of this diagram, the um, Sewanee terrain would um, be equivalent to something like this, and the um, deformed rocks in between w would be somewhere here. A mushwad is a, um, well, for want of a better word, a mushed up bunch of shale. It's a soft rock that gets squeezed during the process of thrusting. And that would be somewhere out in here, and it would be a tiny little thing sitting under there. Uh, the idea is that, I'm better with my hands than anything else, if these rocks are sliding along like this, there's a certain amount of friction here, and if we're looking at particularly strong or brittle rock, and then weak rocks underneath, and there's a sort of a deflection like that, then as this stiffer rock tries to ride up over this one, that leaves a space in here that gets filled up with the mushed shale. So um, I guess in a, in a large sense, we could say there's a mass of sort of smushed up rock in here, but uh, Specifically, what I had in mind for Mushwad is, is that kind of smaller scale structure. Does that have any implications for the um, The um, Gadsden Mushwad in Alabama has been explored for shale gas. Um, I, I, I know you've all heard about drilling for shale gas, and typically you're looking at a, a shale bed that's two or three hundred feet thick, and so they drill down and then drill horizontally through two or three hundred feet of shale for a couple of thousand feet with the idea of exposing more shale to the well bore. The mushwad is 10,000 feet thick. So if you drill a hole down through it, you can drill straight and drill through 10,000, expose 10,000 feet of shale. Now, the problem, I think, with the production there is these are Cambrian age uh, shales, and so uh, there's relatively little organic productivity and so there's low total organic carbon in those shales and as a result they don't make as much gas. But that was drilled for uh, gas and one field was established. They had 13 producing wells but the flow was very low and then gas prices went down and it's no longer economic. It's currently shut in. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of discussion of that uh, because uh, one, one way to, to think about it, as you said, is these pieces are moving toward each other, and then suddenly they decide to go the other way. Uh, I think uh, perhaps the most compelling argument is that continental crust is rather thick, and it acts as, uh, in effect, an insulating blanket for the deeper rocks in the mantle. And so uh, that would produce a buildup of heat here in contrast to, say, over the ocean basins where they, it does not have 
that covering blanket of continental crust. And so if um, high, higher heat concentration is occurring here, this produces in effect a sort of upwelling flow, a convective flow of heat that begins to generate forces that are pushing the continents back apart. Now, uh, whether that works or not, I, I, I think it's debatable, but uh, I think that's probably right now the, the best explanation for how this is initiated. I think, uh, yeah. Do you see um, in your work when you're assembling a, a continent, particularly Pangea, any evidence of some very short lived, very intense tectonic pulses? Because on the Cumberland Plateau, the, in the Mississippian, the Port Payne, Warsaw, St. Louis interval, uh, sea level appears to be just having an absolute largest breakdown. Uh, any thoughts on, do you, have, do you have any evidence that you see these sudden very sharp pulses of tectonism or is it stretched out over a longer period of time? Well, I think a little of both because in, in general it's stretched out over uh, at least a few million years. But if um, we're in an area where uh, the basement rocks already have some faults in them. I think there's the possibility of generating uh, localized movement along pre-existing faults uh, as a result of a, the broader process. And so you, you might get the impression of fairly abrupt movements on some of those faults and not on others. But I think that would take looking back into the basement, uh, to the, at least the top of the basement, to try to figure out whether there were pre-existing faults there. In this scenario, what is the Brevard zone? Oops. There's probably a better way to do this, right? I, I think the best answer I can give to that would be um, I should have put some more detail in here. And uh, uh, because what what this shows is one big chunk, and that's obviously not correct. There are lots of internal faults here, and I'd put the Brevard zone somewhere in here. I think, that, you know, looking at that, I think would be an interesting possibility. I'm not aware that it's been done. Well, I, I think. Um, that is perhaps an artifact of plate motions where ocean basins are being consumed and if the plates continue to move unobstructed they run together so it it, it it's in effect if we look at the present pacific ocean it's a wide ocean basin but the opposite sides are moving toward each other and so eventually those will close up and the atlantic is getting bigger at the same time Yes. 
I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. Um, no, I don't think so. Its position relative to the North Pole would depend on whether the continent is moving in that direction. But um, the, um, uh, the northern side of North America also has um, a collisional orogenic belt of about the same age as the Appalachians and the Washita's, indicating that there were collisions going on along the north side uh, that are much the same. And, um, and as you can see from the map here, there's an implication of some of the pieces of uh, Eurasia that were perhaps involved in that collision. Well, I focused on um, this area down here because that's where I've been working. But um, uh, Sewanee, Sabine, Coela are in here. If we start a little further north, uh, Avalonia uh, fits in along here. Um, Avalon uh, was, I think, first recognized in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, there was a separate uh, piece that was recognized in Virginia, and I think it's sub most people now think that's all part of one general system there. There are several other pieces along here. There's one called Carolinia, for example. Um, and all of these have characteristics that indicate that they are part of uh, Gondwana. In fact, I think I forgot to mention Gondwana as we went along a while ago. Uh, South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, Australia uh, was all assembled as a continent. And when the Pangaea collision occurred, it was between North America, Eurasia, which had also already been assembled. And this collision here was technically between Gondwana and uh, Laurasia. But uh, I just talked about the pieces here. So there was uh, this, this earlier assembly of Gondwana, but Gondwana is not exactly a supercontinent because it didn't include all of the continental crust. Mm -hmm. um, there are a variety of ways of looking at the processes in, in original crust formation. And so maybe one way of thinking about it, you know, there was the very first piece of crust that arrived from differentiation within the earth. And so you've got this little blob. Does it get bigger or do you make another one over here and then somehow assemble those? And so I think those are the kinds of questions that you'd have to get at. Another question is, did, did the crust originally form as a thinner layer and then as a result of these processes of squeezing together get thickened and so through time continental crust has gotten progressively thicker? Um, I know there, there are several arguments both ways on, on those, but uh, I think you, you could certainly project this back in time and, and ask that very question. when. Uh, another question that's been asked is when did plate tectonics begin? Because you have to have certain differentiation within the earth in order for plate tectonics processes to work. And then th that's tied in also to this question of generation of crust. Uh, another way to look at that is are we still progressively making more continental crust? So the con volume of continental crust is increasing through time as a result of differentiation. And there's some arguments that says if that's true then it also has to thicken because you, you, in order to make the oceans work relative to the continents, continental crust has to be thick enough to raise a certain freeboard above sea level. 
So it's a very complicated question, but a very interesting one. When does water enter the picture? Um, sort of a, that's another manifestation of the same question, but I think in terms of how we understand the evolution of continental crust, as I was just saying, we, we need to think in terms of, of oceanic water. And um, as more or less as far back as we have a rock record, there's some indication that there begins to be water. Well, the yeah. It, it, instead of, um, I like to think of a rift as being pulled apart. These are pushed together, and um, the big picture answer to what caused it is this set of collisions here. If you look at it in detail, it's uh, uh, it would be uh, what we're seeing here is is this part. These are the faults. Um, they push up like that, and then erosion of these uptilted rocks makes a long ridge. And so, but the, the process of pushing these up is driven by the process of forcing these up and these and, uh, during the, the uh, collisions with the other plates. Thank you. Thank you.